was looking this morning and I was diagnosed in October of 1991. I was 33 years old and had a three-year-old child. So it was a, it was a shock. I had no family history of breast cancer. Um, like many women, I found my breast cancer. I was doing my monthly self-exam and found a lump and went to the doctor and um, in September of 91 and by early in October knew that I had breast cancer and was going to have some treatment, found out it had spread to my lymph nodes and you know so uh, it was a it was a shock. I had been working for the City of Hope at that time uh, just a little more than a year so I was I had a new job and had a small child and it, it was uh, facing my own mortality at 33, you know. In our 30s, we're all Teflon, you know, nothing's gonna hurt us. I'd never had any health problems, and so it was just the kind of thing where you're thinking about, oh gee, and like I said, no, no one in my family had ever had breast cancer. I think one of the hardest things I've ever had to do was call my parents and tell them. Mm -hmm. It was really hard. They were, uh, in North Carolina a long way away and telling them that I had breast cancer, telling my husband that I had breast cancer was really hard and you know a three-year-old you can't tell a three-year-old they don't, they don't have breast cancer from nothing. So. Well early on you know you do the testing to find out where all it is. Found out I had lymph node involvement you know ended up doing a a process of taking out lymph nodes at that time, which is not the standard treatment anymore, and uh, realized uh, pretty quickly I was referred from Hope to UAMS, who I credit to this day the decision to refer me and the decision of the people at UAMS, I, the reason I'm here 30 years later. I'm here because those people gave me the best care I can imagine, and they did that because people here referred me to them. Mm -hmm. They quickly realized I had aggressive breast cancer, that it was obviously early on said that I wasn't, you know, the normal age to really be having that kind of, you know, stuff. And um, so I started out with a lumpectomy and then uh, because of complications, a mastectomy and then did a long session at that time of chemotherapy. And, I was all well and good, I thought, by the summer of 1992, and just just ready to go back. I beat that old breast cancer out of the way, and uh, you know I was going back to my life, looking to having another child, and you know pursuing my career. And uh, during that period of time, moved to Hope in '93, and really establishing and making friendships here in my community and my church. And then uh, early in 94, I realized I had a lump in my neck. So I went up to UMS again, and unfortunately I'd had a recurrence already. So it was within about 18 months of finishing my first treatments. and. That's not good, you know. Again, I'm at this point uh, 35 years old, still not thinking that, you know, this is going to be a life-threatening thing, but they're basically saying, even though it's a small situation, the fact that it's recurred so quickly and recurred not in the, the original area, it means it's very serious. So yeah. I did more chemo. I did um, that summer two bone marrow transplants, which again are not standard treatment now. Uh, didn't turn out to be efficacious for a lot of people, but for whatever reason, some of that treatment, uh, like I said, had more chemo, had those bone marrow transplants with high dose chemotherapy. And then, then the, that fall uh, had a long course of radiation. So through 94, 95, I was having breast cancer treatment. So between 91 and 95, I spent the majority of time without any hair, um, undergoing breast cancer treatment. And 
uh, with the assistance of my family, including my dear husband Jeff and my parents and all my other extended family. It's a turf war. I mean, the turf's your body. You're fighting for it. Um, they asked me how aggressive I wanted to be, and I said, I got a three-year-old, I got a five-year-old. We've got to be pretty aggressive. My only goal at that time really just honestly was to get to the age where if something really did happen to me, she'd remember me. I just wanted to get old enough that, you know, I, I'd been a little bit older when I first had a child and I was like, I really, I want her to remember me. So I was like, y'all got it, you, you throw it at me. I, I can take it. And like I said, with the support of my family and my friends and my church, actually many churches uh, around the area and the, and the country and their prayers and everything, I mean, I felt like I made it through it. But I mean, it, I spent at 1.6 weeks in the hospital at UMS uh, and really couldn't have done it without my family, without my husband and my parents. My parents basically relocated themselves from North Carolina to here, and my husband basically continued to work full-time, but also became a full-time caregiver to our child, because I spent a lot of time in Little Rock in the hospital and in treatment. I was blessed to have good treatment, blessed to have good family, blessed to have good friends and, and people praying for me, really blessed to even though I was relatively new on the job, I got a lot of support from work. Mm -hmm. And um, like I said, not everybody has that. Um, was it hard? It, it was really hard. Particularly, I think the worst part was the second diagnosis, realizing that it could potentially be the rest of my life that it wasn't a one-time battle, that I wasn't going to just have to go through the chemo and, okay, we get over it. Okay, I'm well now again. But the idea that the rest of whatever my life was going to be might be treatment and fighting breast cancer. Now, fortunately, it wasn't. There's a funny story. In the summer of 1992, I had a complication where I got blood clots in one of my pores and got an infection and was very sick and had to have IV antibiotics for a long time. And so my parents and I basically had a summer vacation in Little Rock. We were staying at a hotel called the Mark Command across from the War Memorial uh, Golf Course. And I am, of course, bald, you know, very bald. Uh, and I guess about 34 years old at that point. And so my mother and father and I thought they'd take me out for an outing. We went across the street and were walking down the trail at the golf course. I got on my blinged up cap, didn't have on a wig, couldn't stand to wear one at that time. Walking around with my parents, I'm 34 years old, you know. Walking around a golf course area with my folks. <laughs> My father never met a stranger and is literally visiting with the golfers as they go by. And I'm sitting here thinking, oh my goodness, somebody could just laugh and laugh. Here I am They're thinking, they've got this poor, pitiful child, a uh, half-grown child. She's obviously in terrible shape because I've got to, they were having to put a big bandage on my neck to put the IV antibiotics in and everything. I'm obviously bald as a cue ball you know, wandering around looking sickly with my parents dragging along. And I was, we were all just happy as clams. <laughs> we were watching the Olympics on television every day and going and getting my antibiotics and had a great family situation. But that same day, we went back to the clinic and we were walking along. There's some long hallways at UMS. And mom and dad and I, I'm literally like dragging a bag of medicine on a little pole thing, you know. And got mom and dad and we're just tooling along, tooling, because like I said, dad man never met a stranger. And there's a young woman who's sitting down at the side of the hallway. And she was just, she's crying and obviously upset and worn out. 
and you know my parents were not the kind of people they they were taking care of me but there was enough left over so we stopped and visited and figured out she was there by herself she was there having breast cancer treatment by herself she was so tired and worn out like we all were and she was there by herself and of course my mom and daddy being my mom and daddy you know went and got her something to eat and drink and we got her they got her into a chair and you know got her comforted and and you know got her situated and she was all right she was just having one of those low spells but you know you could be sitting there thinking i'm thinking you know you can get a little pity party going easy mm -hmm. you know you're sick you got it you got an infection, you know, you got breast cancer. Yeah. I was sliding on through. She was by herself. It makes, just makes a huge difference. In our Hope First United Methodist Choir, there are actually several of us who's ha who have had breast cancer, and we're we're all we've taken. Uh, uh, it's been a few years ago now. We had a photo. I think there were like eight of us in the choir who had had breast cancer at one point or another. And you know, you you do feel a kinship. You do feel an automatic. Okay, can I help you? Is there anything that will make what you're going through easier? You know, you know what it's like. Uh, do you need to talk or uh, do you just need to vent at some point to someone who knows what it's like? You want to be positive for, you know, your family and everything, but sometimes you just need to say, boy, am I going to make it through this? Do I have the strength to make it through this? I was part of a support group in Texarkana for several years, mm -hmm. and one, someone I got close to, and uh, who was a fellow member of that club, uh, was a lady named Bonnie Roy from Hope. Her, her mom still lives here. And uh, I think several of her kids and grandkids still live here. Uh, and uh, we got to be friends and we carried, carried each other to support group in Texarkana as long as she was alive. And, uh, uh, you know, you do feel a kinship. Even with people who come from you know, a different background, different wall, you know, different interests, but you're automatically members of, of that club. And um, now, all these years later, there's not anybody I still keep in contact with. Um, but, but, you know, the, you are members of that same, like I said, club you didn't ever want to join. <laughs> of breast cancer is that in my 30s I found out what's really important in life. I know that my family's important and my churches and faith are important and uh, the things that are really important to me. Everybody in their 30s doesn't get that gift. I mean, like I said, most people in their 30s, me in my 30s, you know, I was focused on my family and my career and stuff, but I was, I was, it was all future oriented. I wasn't worrying about my health. I'd never had any health problems. But, you know, those 30 years after that, I mean, I know what's important. And I think in a lot of ways, it made me a stronger person because I've been in the trenches. I've, I've fought for my life with everything that I could do. Um, I've, I've talked my way out of the hospital telling them that I was on a full diet when all I could eat was half-strength apple juice. But I wanted out of the hospital after six weeks. Uh, but my strength came from faith and my family and the support that I had. I, w I have met so many people over the years while I was going to UMS and subsequently in other places 
who didn't have support. I mean, I, I've, you know, what what do you do if, if you don't have anybody to carry you to the doctor appointment? What if you do if you don't have any money, you, you've lost your job because, you know, you didn't have any sick leave or you don't have sick leave at your job? What if you do if you don't have health insurance? I mean, there are so many women who face breast cancer who don't have that kind of those things in their life. They just don't. And so, like I said, I mean, that's the gift. The gift of knowing that, first of all, I was blessed and all of that, but also that, that not just the gift of survival, but the gift of really knowing the rest of your life. All the rest of the days are, are what they call in Louisiana, that little bit of something extra. You got that little bit of something extra, but you get it every single day of your life. And you, you, you survive through the grace of God. Not, not really through anything you did or even any, but the grace of God, which is the unmerited work of God on your behalf. And that grace is a gift to know every day what's important. When you get up in the morning, you think you're having a bad day and you think the world's against you, or you stubbed your toe, literally I've done that, or, or whatever else is happening that's messing up your whole world outlook. It, it's not. It, 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 it's, it's stuff. Okay, I've stubbed my toe. <laughs> you know, I've survived it. I have certainly some lingering long-term consequences from it. But, you know, I'm a stronger, more in tune with what's really important in life person to string a bunch of words together than I would ever have been if I'd never faced breast cancer. And, and that, that's a gift. Women know when their body changes. Uh, women just know that if you become familiar with your own anatomy, you become familiar when there's a change in your anatomy. And you're, you're the first line of defense to find something like that. Now, the strange part about it was I found that lump and didn't find until I was having a biopsy the fact that there was a similar size lump up under my arm, which was my lymph node. I never found that one. It was it was way out of where I was, you know, uh, ex examining. But um, uh, but breast self exam is the first thing. Know your own anatomy, and, and if you see any difference, be be your own medical advocate. Because a lot of times, you know, even in these days when we're all more familiar with things, you go in and you say, well, you know, something's different, and Sometimes, it, depending on who your medical provider may be, they may say, oh, well, really, it's not. But if you think it's different, go on and, and keep pursuing it. Be an advocate for your, own, uh, for your own care. If you're not an advocate for your own care, you know, other people are, are not going to notice it. N know your own anatomy. I mean, it's important, and if you don't do that, you know, you can miss things. And particularly in my case, I mean, I wouldn't have had a mammogram in, in the normal course of events till I was 50 years old, probably. I, I would have never made 50. There's no question in my mind. I mean, it, you know, I would have probably somewhere in my 30s, as we say in the South, up and died. <laughs> and this is not just true with breast cancer, but with, you know, other bodily ailments, you know, advocates. You know, certainly, uh, you know, uh, do the exams that are recommended. Knowing what's important, knowing mm -hmm. what you're fighting for, knowing, um, you know, that that it, you've really just got to put everything you've got into it. You, you can't, you, don't go in it thinking, you know, you can play halfway you got to throw everything you've got at anything that's in your soul that you can, strength that you can come up with. Uh, for me, like I said, I had a three-year-old. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think there was some bargaining, 
which I don't consider effective, with God about, please, God, just let me. Just, you know, just let me. Just let's let me get to the point. You know, there were some pretty serious. Like I said, I don't think that's necessarily very effective. As I learned more spiritually, I prayed a lot more. But, you know, you start out bargaining, just, just let me. But you got to reach down deep into whatever's in you. Unfortunately, I come from a long line of, of women and people who just, I mean, when, when it gets tough, you just, you just keep putting one foot in front of the other and you just keep going and had the assistance of a whole lot, a lot of other people who had the same thoughts. I am a person who doesn't, I, I'm kind of an emotionally private person. Mm -hmm. So sharing uh, one of the hard things about breast cancer and the whole thing was it seemed like everyone knew everything. And it was hard for me, but I, I, I learned to be better. And one of the things I I did learn was also that you you do have to go on and be willing to be emotionally vulnerable sometimes. It's It's not an easy look for me because I, I love strength and I'm a, I think I'm a very strong person. But there there's no value in not really communicating what it's like. Uh, that's not, to just say everything's always fine, that's not going to help anybody. You have to be willing to get out there and to put yourself out there. And if you're not willing to do that, then, for instance, with regard to this, I would have just had to say, if I'm not willing to do that, I should have just said, no, can't do that for you. Can't do that. But if if I am willing, if, if, if I say yes, then I've got to be willing to be honest. You can figure out what's important in your life. Find your faith. Love your family. Uh, know what's important in your life. You don't have to go through a life-threatening illness to find that out and to make that investment in your own life. You can, you can find that out. You don't have to do it the hard way. Some of us are just hard-headed, but you, you can find that out in your life without doing it.
just makes a huge difference. So if, you know, these days we, we do all the Facebook stuff and we help people out, but people who help other people out when they're facing the hard times in their life, that means so much to people. Be there, step up, be there for Because, you know, it's hard. But imagine how hard it would be you're sitting in a hallway, you're having breast cancer treatment, you got nobody. you got nobody with you. You've got no family, no friends, no helping out. I was lucky. I've been lucky. I don't play the lottery. I'm not a gambling person. Because obviously my odds, particularly on <laughs> breast cancer, didn't go so well. But, but I've been really an incredibly lucky, blessed person in my life.
I was going to ask you if you, I don't know how to ask this question, but you kind of said something just then that leads into it. Were you able to keep in touch with that lady? No, you met, one of the things you found out there is at UMS, and particularly when I was having bone marrow transplants sometimes, you'd meet people from all over and you'd never see them again. Sometimes you could inquire after them and if it wasn't a medical question, staff would let you know. Other times, not. Now, my mother, like I said, you've already heard about my parents. I said my father never met a stranger. My mother didn't either. My mother, while I was in the hospital at one point, met a really nice lady whose name I can't remember at the moment from the Ozan area. And uh, they kept in touch and had lunch every time my mom was in Hope for years till that lady passed away. Uh, you know, just, you know, it, it just, some people you, you got to know and, and others mm -hmm. you, you didn't. And other people you, you just, you know, you, you passed. But, but like, even in that passing, there's a kinship? There, there is. I mean, you're all in that same, you know, you'd see those people walking by, you know, they, they're, they're in obviously difficult shape. They're thin and wan and have that coloring and lack of hair that is so prevalent still even. And then you realize, I look just like them, <laughs> you know. You don't want to laugh, you don't want, you think, because, you know, your self-image in your own mind, even when you're in that shape, you, you think you're still looking like you always look. And you don't realize, I'm, I'm, one, of the, I'm one of these people. You're a member of the club. Yeah, and it's a club you didn't ever want to join, and it's a, a club that you didn't want to be a part of. And it's a club that defines the rest of your life. Uh, one of the other funny bits is after uh, all my breast cancer treatment and radiation and everything, and my husband and I were having a, he, he was a funny person, and we had this funny conversation about this, that um, the interest. I was part of a support group in Texarkana for several years, mm -hmm. and one, someone I got close to, and uh, who was a fellow member of that club, uh, was a lady named Bonnie Roy from Hope. Her, her mom still lives here, and uh, I think several of her kids and grandkids still live here. Uh, and uh, we got to be friends and carried carried each other to support group in Texarkana as long as she was alive. And, uh, uh, you know, you do feel a kinship. Even with people who come from, you know, a different background, different wall, you know, different interests, but you're automatically members of, of that club. And um, now, all these years later, there's not anybody I still keep in contact with. Um, but, but, you know, the, you are members of that same, like I said, club you didn't ever want to join. <laughs> now, the gift of breast cancer is that in my 30s, 
I found out what's really important in life. I know that my family's important and my churches and faith are important and uh, the things that are really important to me. Everybody in their 30s doesn't get that gift. I mean, like I said, most people in their 30s, me in my 30s, you know, I was focused on my family and my career and stuff, but I was, I was, it was all future oriented. I wasn't worrying about my health. I'd never had any health problems. But, you know, those 30 years after that, I mean, I know what's important. And I think in a lot of ways, it made me a stronger person. It made me a, maybe in some ways, a more dangerous person. <laughs> Because I've been in the trenches. I've, I've fought for my life with everything that I could do. Um, I've, I've talked my way out of the hospital telling them that I was on a full diet when all I could eat was half-strength apple juice. But I wanted out of the hospital after six weeks. But... My strength came from faith and my family and the support that I had. I, w I have met so many people over the years while I was going to UMS and subsequently in other places who didn't have support. I mean, I, I've, you know, what, what do you do if, if you don't have anybody to carry you to the doctor appointment? What if you do if you don't? have any money, you, you've lost your job because you knew you didn't have any sick leave or you don't have sick leave at your job. What do you do if you don't have health insurance? I mean, there are so many women who face breast cancer who don't have that kind of, those things in their life. They just don't. And so, like I said, I mean, that's the gift. The gift of knowing that First of all, I was blessed in all of that, but also that that not just the gift of survival, but the gift of really knowing the rest of your life. All the rest of the days are, are what they call in Louisiana, that little bit of something extra. You got that little bit of something extra, but you get it every single day of your life. And you, you, you survive through the grace of God. Not, not really through anything you did or even any, but the grace of God, which is the unmerited work of God on your behalf. And that grace is a gift to know every day what's important. When you get up in the morning, you think you're having a bad day, and you think the world's against you, or you stubbed your toe, literally I've done that, or, or whatever else is happening that's messing up your whole world outlook. It's not. It, 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 it's, it's stuff. It doesn't compare. It's stuff. And, you know, a lot of people face cancer at different ages, but facing it in your 30s where, like I said, you really feel like you're Teflon. Nothing's going to hurt you. Worst thing that can happen is a car accident, really. You've never been sick, you know. Nobody in your family's ever had breast cancer. But somebody's got to be the first one. And now, 30 years later, my daughter's older than I was when I was diagnosed. And of course, she goes through special testing to make sure that, you know, anything that would happen with her would be caught early. Hopefully she'll never have any problems. I've gone through breast cancer gene testing. Mm -hmm. I don't apparently carry a breast cancer gene. Visiting with the doctors at UMS, it sounds crazy to say, but one of the best doctors I've ever known up there, and she's now down in Galveston, Dr. Suzanne Klimberg, really nation, world-recognized breast cancer surgeon. We talked about it because we kind of became friends over the years. Um, what happened? It was probably just bad luck. One day, sometime, a cell divided improperly. And my immune system didn't go squash it out. And so over years, it just, you know, it kept doing its nasty little thing. And, you know, okay, I've stubbed my toe. <laughs> you know, I've survived it. I have certainly some lingering long-term consequences from it. 
but you know, I'm a stronger, more in tune with what's really important in life person to string a bunch of words together than I would ever have been if I'd never faced breast cancer. And, and that, that's a gift. Well, you kind of already answered quite a few of my questions, and so you were diagnosed, went through the treatment, diagnosed a second time shortly thereafter, went through more aggressive treatment. Any recurrences since then? No, no. I've had, again, several what they call after effects of radiation, mm -hmm. some from the chemo, various things like that, uh, you know, various various things, but um, you put them on the one hand, okay, I have my life, or I have a few of these side effects from some of the treatment. Okay, well, let's party. You know, I mean, in, in retrospect, in, in, in the balance, they're, 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 I, I've had 30 years with more with my child. I've always heard that the after effects, well, I had an aunt who had breast cancer as well, it, it changes you and that you're different. Oh, you Your are. body, everything. Not just mentally, physically. I mean, everything's different after. Everything's different. I, I mean, I think one of the things about my youth at the time was, you know, I, I, I maybe maybe more than people want to know, and, and you can take that out if you need to. I, I went and visited UAMS six week, every six weeks for years. And I didn't really realize that other people were on a longer schedule. <laughs> it's like, okay, you know, some people are going every three months, every six months, and it never occurred to me for years that, why did they keep wanting to see, maybe they just like me. <laughs> and uh, I didn't have reconstruction for several years. And I didn't bring it up, but then I started pushing it. You know, women want to have uh, reconstruction. You want to mm -hmm. do what you need to do. Uh, and I, so I finally started asking them, and they said, well, okay, we, we think you're far enough out now, maybe. I said, well, why, why haven't we been pushing this? And they said, oh, well, we're pretty sure you were going to have a recurrence. <laughs> I was like, okay, glad you didn't tell me that. I've been just sure that this was all gone, but, but I've never had a recurrence, just some after effects. And what I did, like I said, what I have had are 30 more years with my child. I, I had, uh, you know, uh, 28 years more with my husband. I was about to ask how many years you've been cancer free. So that would be. I finished my radiation up in the spring of 95. Okay. So. Uh, 26 of, years 26 now. years. Okay. So you've been cancer-free for 26 years. Yep. And you, you've already answered so many of my questions uh, about not being able to do it with support. Let's do a quick technical. In your initial diagnosis, did they give a form or type? Um, I believe that, that it was, uh, I ended up with two different <laughs> types. 
like a ductal uh, and also a lobular. Mm -hmm. So, and they were both what they call poorly differentiated. Okay. You know, the cells weren't growing properly. They were growing fast. They didn't have any good characteristics of regular cells anymore. They had obviously spent a good little bit of time figuring out how to be cancer cells. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, some of my early problems involved the fact that after my initial lumpectomy, within about 10 days, I had a massive hemorrhage within the site, which was not good. And then I had to have an uh, emergency mastectomy. And after that, about 10 days after that, I had a massive hemorrhage from the site. And again, I didn't know it at the time because, you know, Google wasn't out there then. But those were very poor indicators. Something was wrong with my vascular system in the area of the original cancer. It had already gotten into those areas, apparently, or something. So uh, it was affecting that. Now, fortunately, I, I got through it, but there there were some harrowing times where literally I was, my uh, beloved parents were carrying me out to a follow-up trip to after surgery to Little Rock, and I realized something was very badly wrong, and my mother was an RN, and she said, you're hemorrhaging. And my father, who I think we were in Sheridan, Arkansas or somewhere, got in the car and put the pedal to the metal the rest of the way to Little Rock and I kept you know doing that thing where you're getting faint getting faint neither of my parents had ever been to UAMS at that point so I'm trying to stay up enough dad's like what turn off what the exit GPS. <laughs> what exit there's none of that you know <laughs> in, in that time frame and my dad's saying you've got to tell me what turn off and I'm I think it's Woodrow or Cedar, you know, and, let, and my mom's saying, you keep going, and we rush into the emergency room, and they're like, oh, hmm, you're doing a good, uh, a good um, uh, job of trying to bleed out here. <laughs> it's, it, it's amusing in the past. It was a, it wasn't. At the moment, a, probably not. At, at the moment, not, because I'm sitting there thinking, I can't even have a good faint. You know, I've never been a fainter in my life, but I can't even kind of lay back and do the southern woman thing where we're doing like that because dad needs to know the turn off. Well, why, if you were so young, you weren't doing like regular mammograms, how did they, how did this all come about? Well, it was kind of strange. I was just, um, you know, just, you know, and, uh, Really, my my initial lump was right up here on the front, which is not a normal stand, you know, usually end up. Uh, but it just, I felt it. It's like, oh, okay. Well, that's, and I had had, um, sorry, my stomach's rumbling. Um, I had had some breast examinations in the past because of some cyst. And so, um, that just happened to be where one of those was. And I thought, this isn't the same. So I uh, went in and I think the initial person I saw was probably Dr. Johnny Jones, who was an OB-GYN here at that time. And still, you know, out and about. And then ended up that, that vi visited with several local doctors and ended up uh, having a biopsy from a classmate of mine that had been at SAU and was a surgeon here at that time. And,
like I said, I had bone marrow transplants and uh, they tried it out as a test treatment for, for uh, you know, breast cancer and really found that it, interesting they thing didn't about think breast cancer through treatment the studies is that it, it's all that effective. Between the insurance and our own personal me from funding having and another everything. recurrence. If it you is, spend the most money wasn't. you've ever spent well, I made on it anything through it. in your yeah. whole life. You know, I, I, it's another one of those things and the goal is that they don't tell you. Nothing. 15% of people didn't make it through those bone marrow transplants. The success is having nothing. And so it was successful. Money for nothing. That phrase. Well, it makes I mean, you know, it's Get to the age that mammograms are recommended, go ahead and do them, do them regularly. When, um, if you're high risk, keep your appointments, particularly do your, you know, uh, your, your testing and things like that. And then ad advocate for your own care. I mean, like I said, you know your own body and uh, everyone does or should and, and get aware of what, changes it. And this is not just true with breast cancer, but with, you know, other bodily ailments, you know, advocate, you know, certainly, uh, you know, uh, do the exams that are recommended.
Well, you have completely enthralled me with your story. Is there, are there any other lasting impressions that it's, that has been left with you? I think you answered really well. You, you now recognize what's important. Is there anything you think other people should know or that might be helpful? Well, what I would say to other people who are not facing cancer is, like that. Thank you so much for coming today. I really enjoyed, I don't know if that's a great I like that. It. I mean, was a, it was a hard time for you, but I enjoyed hearing your story. Well, it's just hard. Thank you so much um, for coming today. I really enjoyed, I don't know if that's a great way to say it. I mean, I was a, it was a hard time for you, but I enjoyed hearing your story. Well, it's just hard. Um, I appreciate your honesty. I, I just, it sounds like you did it. I don't know how else to say this, and I hate to be cliche. An experience like this, you really have to I appreciate your honesty. I, I just, it sounds like you did it. I don't know how else to say this, and I hate to be cliche. An experience like this, you really have to dig down and like search yourself, um, know yourself, and. and well, thank you, and I I, I enjoy hearing your interpretation of it all. Let's put it that way. I loved your metaphors and things uh -huh. like that, um, and I'm so glad you came in. I really am. Well, thank you, and I, I appreciate you doing what you can to encourage people, um, you know, whatever the current statistics are, one in seven, one in eight of women at some point. Uh, certainly survival's improved over time. Hopefully, it'll continue to improve. But it, it's just like some of the other things. Um, I've lost really good friends to prostate cancer. We, we, can, we can change that. You know, that can be changed. Breast cancer survival can be changed. It is being changed. has been changed. Let's do it. And thank you all for helping with it.
thing about breast cancer treatment is between insurance and our own personal funding and everything, you spend the most money you've ever spent on anything in your whole life. And the goal is to have nothing. The success is having nothing. And so it was successful. Money for nothing. That phrase. Well, it makes I mean, sense. you know, it's just a huge amount of money. And <clears throat> yeah. Like, uh, you know, but you, you, you don't want to end up with anything. You want all the cancer to be gone and you want to be cancer free. And, and, and that's what you want. And that's the, the that's success is rated by you don't have any more cancers. 